Operating Systems Automation Roadmap. And as Mori mentioned, we've now picked up the term DSA BOC because of the body of knowledge we've generated within this product, within this work product. So what's the definition of interoperability? Um, if you go and look at Merriam's Marion Webster's dictionary, it talks about the ability of a system to work with or use the parts or equipment of another system. And a lot of this, of course, has come from weapon systems. How do pieces and parts fit together so they can operate together? And then if you look at Wikipedia, it talks about a characteristic of a product or system whose interfaces are completely understood to work with other products or systems, a present or future, in either implementation or access without any restrictions. So here we're talking of systems and at the lower level of products and that they can work without any restrictions whatsoever. I put it to you that drilling's far behind other industries and I start out with two headings here, other industries and drilling. And if you look through other industries, what you can get find out about is the field bus wars. These occurred in the 1990s. I, I think they're not fully over, but the field bus wars did result in open systems. And there have been some great presentations to our group by John Berrer, who was the former chairman of Emerson. And he showed how the companies like Emerson that went with the open systems grew in an environment where proprietary companies began to decline and some even failed. So the open systems won. And then we have telecoms, internet, computer hardware. I mean, we plug everything together and it plays. Our phone plays with something else. The printer automatically lines up with the computer. These people have created fully interoperable systems and we enjoy them. We don't have hassles. We don't have to hire experts. We don't have to pay tons of money to connect things together. The Department of Defense in 2011 put out a roadmap. They did update it in 2013, and it's on unmanned systems integration. And they, of course, are looking at land, sea, and air. So they're looking across a very large spectrum, and their driver here is to have systems that will fully interoperate. Of course, if they don't interoperate, their consequences are very large. Autos are, some of you may have come across this. It's an organization that's driven by a lot of the big names in the automobile industry. I think there's about nine steering committee companies. There are 55 other companies at another tier and some other companies involved. So really it's everybody who's involved in automation is involved in Autosar. And they are building open systems architecture and they do this under their banner of cooperate on standards and compete on innovation. So this industry, the automobile industry, has figured out that if you can build standards where you can plug and play together, you can then go and innovate in your own space. I found another one is ISOBUS, which is a bit similar to Autosar. And it's in agricultural machinery. So you can get a seed machine that will connect onto a tractor and they can all run together. And it involves all the aspects of, of agricultural machinery. And there's another one which has been launched in Europe, which is looking at safety and time critical systems. And I think what's really interesting, it says across rail, automotive, aerospace, health sector. But I don't see the energy industry in that or drilling. And then the Department of Transport has published a very interesting strategic plan looking, it was published in 2015, looking out to 2019. And they identify interoperability as one of the six key program categories. And of course, they're beginning to look at autonomous vehicles. So interoperability, not only within the vehicle or between vehicles, but with other traffic systems or transport systems becomes paramount for success. Um, drilling, proprietary, you know, that's been the big advantage people have seen. And they, they believe they have competitive advantage from it. And I just say, Shh, don't say this out loud, because every time I have a conversation with somebody, they say, well, I shouldn't really be saying this. I'll meet you in the bar later and we'll have a beer and discuss it. MDIS, which was launched in 2010, it published a full standard, I think, in 2017. And MDIS is 
on subsea production control system, and it's the full interfacing of the systems. OPC was a big uh, steering member of this and, and provided the systems to connect everything together. It basically, they built an interface standardization. And from what I understand, they cut the lead time for hookups by 90%, cut by 90%. And they save 10% cost. So the cost savings weren't the massive piece. It was the lead time for hookup, which, of course, is production. And then our own uh, initiative with the roadmap and the DSA block, which is actually is a first-of-a-kind initiative when we start to look at steering the industry or where the industry is going to steer itself. And within the roadmap, interoperability, we call it one of the forks in the road. We're not saying it's going to happen soon or it's going to happen later. We're trying to understand when the industry might adopt it and what the consequences would be if you look into the future. And then the question for the drilling industry is what's next? Do nothing or have an industry initiative? I think Mori talked about a number of initiatives within DSAT which do contribute towards interoperability. But if you look at what these other industries have done, they've taken significant steps with all the players involved. We haven't figured that out yet. What are the key aspects of interoperability? So as I see it, it's systems architecture. Uh, Mori mentioned this as well. And within the roadmap or the body of knowledge, we've actually created systems of systems and systems of interest. And what we've defined is three levels. One is a reference architecture, which is a high level. And there's a pattern architecture in between and the solutions architecture at the low level. And the solutions architecture is where all the company innovation goes on. But the reference architecture, if it were adopted, would provide a framework for interoperability. And then there's a decision and control framework that we've developed that incorporates ISA 95, or is in fact based upon it, and manufacturing execution systems, which actually put on top of ISA 95 MRP systems. So how are you, how are you planning and executing? Standards, I say they're friend, not foe. Um, they ensure symbiosis of hardware and software. And I think we know that from all the connectivity we do every day. Certification and testing, you know, do you know what it does? Um, there's a program that we are launching at the moment, again, out of the, the roadmap initiative with Southwest Research taking the lead on this of independent verification and validation of sensors and systems. And if this initiative is adopted and if the experts in the industry steer it, it will provide a standard methodology to know what sensors are telling you to know what the systems are telling you. I think right now there's a lot of black boxes out there and everybody's trying to verify them themselves in their own way. Unfortunately, Southwest Research does this routinely for commercial aviation, transport, aerospace, etc. Cybersecurity. Yes, it's actually a key aspect. It's very well covered by CIV with the IEDC art team, and I think you've heard that already. Human systems integration. So we're just starting our journey on this. And within the roadmap, what we came out with is levels of automation taxonomy, which is a way to describe how the levels of human interaction with the control system going from manual through to automated in the cycle of acquiring, assessing, deciding, and then taking action. And it becomes a matrix that it can define the levels at which automation is occurring. And if you can define that within systems, you can then share that with other systems so you know how they can interoperate. I think as Mori mentioned, that if you have an advisory mode, you don't necessarily connect to the system except via the human. Safety aspects of human-machine interfaces. Other industries look at this so that they adopt common protocols between the human and the machine interface so they all share on those safety aspects. And of course, the display interfaces with commonality of control do help humans operate. When you get in a rental car, it's basically similar to the other rental car you had last week. You're not fighting a different set of 
switches and levers, etc. Um, time stamps, we call this my clock or yours. Um, there's some people in our industry who know a lot about this. I would say correspondence is a dream without time reality. A lot of people are looking at data and analyzing data uh, across or different sets of data across times, but the times are not correlated, and therefore you have a real challenge. IEEE does provide standards, but in some discussions we have, have had, it's become very clear that downhole to surface and vice versa is a specific industry challenge, and it's, it's very complex. So what's the business value of interoperability? I would say to you it's a reduction of wasted installation and hookup costs. If anybody's following lean manufacturing, and most companies today are telling everybody they are, reduction of waste is, is a key aspect that Taichi Ono created, and that's how he made Toyota so profitable. And here we are that we are not using interoperability to reduce waste. Reduction of time for install and hookup, and that example comes from Midas. It was a huge reduction in time. It's a massive opportunity. The sharing of data and information, and of course, this is already happening with WITSML and OPC, and then the companion spec that these two organizations, Energistics and OPC Foundation, are actually creating for our industry with a lot of work by, by different people supporting this. And then combinations and components and subsystems that deliver value. If you have a component and it doesn't live within a system of interest that actually gives an output, whatever you do, you can't really deliver value from it. So independent components need to become part of a system. The system itself can then deliver the value. If you can't interoperate, you can't come and play. And it enables small entrepreneurs to innovate. They can plug in solutions, again, like a, a component into a, a system of interest, and they can come and play and bring their innovation. So interoperability in drilling. My question is, is it arriving sooner or is it arriving later? I don't know the answer, but I can line up some parts of the question between the racehorse and the donkey. So if we want to be the racehorse and get it sooner, operators are going to have to demand it and suppliers are going to have to value it. And again, MDIS is a great example that's close to drilling where the operators launched this and the vendors did come and work on it and the vendors have seen value from doing it. In our industry so far, I think our operators are more silent than driving this change. Vendors open their systems. If you have closed systems, you're not going to be able to have interoperability. But it, the way it's normally going for us is the vendors are sealing up their proprietary systems. So at what point do they see greater value for themselves included to open up systems? Lessons learned from other industries. All of the other industries I listed have learned these lessons. These lessons have been learned for more than 20 years, maybe even 30 years. We can take that and learn ourselves and look at the value we could achieve. But if we choose to ignore these other lessons, we'll remain at the donkey pace. Senior industry advocates speak up, and that may sound a bit strange, but that was the message that John Berra gave us. And he was one of the ones who spoke up during the field bus wars in the 1990s. So he says industry advocates must speak up in order to drive this kind of change. But so far, I don't think we've found any big senior industry advocates speaking out. Yes, we have DSATs and we have other people speaking up, but not people at chairman level or president level. I think they're asleep at the switch. So operators need interoperability for reduced cost and greater value delivery. They will figure this out. I'm, I'm very sure the operators are going to figure this out. I've had a number of discussions with these people. The real question is, when will they figure it out? And with that, I thank you very much. And uh, after Robert, I'll be taking questions, I understand. OK, thank you.